morning. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter number 20. John 20. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29 here this morning. But before we do that, uh, I want to speak to you guys. This morning we're going to have a test. And some of you guys are trying to sneak out the back now. And, uh, Mr. Ray, it's not multiple choice either. It's actually, it's, it's easier than that. Um, the test that we're going to take here this morning is only one question. And the question is this. Is Jesus God or is he man? The answer to that question is yes. He is both. Jesus is both God and man. In fact, we call him the God-man. God being wrapped in flesh is who Christ is. You know, the prophet Isaiah said this, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That particular passage there in Isaiah says, again, For unto us a child is born. That speaks about Christ being a man. It speaks about his humanity. But then Isaiah goes on to say, For unto us a, a child is given. That speaks about Christ's deity. What I mean by that is, that says that Christ is both fully man and fully God. You see, whenever we celebrate Christmas, we begin to talk about these subjects and about these topics, and we're reminded that Christ was born in Bethlehem. That was his birth. But that wasn't his beginning. In fact, because he is God, he's existed for all of eternity, according to Scripture. He didn't have his beginning at Bethlehem, only his birth. I don't know about you guys, but whenever Christmas comes around, we begin to watch Christmas movies. Does anybody do that? Does anybody enjoy Christmas movies? Well, a few days ago, Emily and I watched The Little House on the Prairie Christmas. All right, guilty. And I don't care what you think about me after I say that, but I I enjoyed the little little house on the prairie Christmas. It's the one where they were the little kids. And anyways, it has nothing to do with this morning. But within that particular episode of Little House on the Prairie, uh, the smallest girl, and I forget her name. You can tell me after the service. But she desired, she wanted more than anything, a star in the store. Does anybody remember this? And she actually saved her money and went and bought this star. But Charles Engel, he began to describe what that star represented. And he got the little girl up on his lap and began to talk about the star that led people who were seeking Jesus to the Savior that was born. And, and it's great. We talk about the star at Christmas and we talk about much of of what I would call the upper side of Christmas. We talk about the stars of Christmas. But very rarely do we speak about the scars of Christmas. And so that's our, that's our subject here this morning. That's where we're going to spend our time. Not talking about the star of Christmas, but instead of the scars of Christmas. Can you imagine a God with scars? I mean, think about that for a second. When we think of the nativity or, or we send our postcards, our Christmas cards, many times we have a picture of a, just the cutest little baby on those cards. And, you know, with a little, man, I love new babies. I mean, obviously. Um, <laughs> but they're just so, there's something about a newborn baby that's cute. They're just kind of wrinkly and man, I like their little toes that just scrunch up. And you think about the manger scene, you think about a little newborn baby, the Savior. But it would be those cute little scrunched up feet and toes that would later be pierced with nails and would produce scars. And many times we don't, we don't talk about that subject. And so this morning, we, again, we find our place in John 20, verses 24 through 28 or 9, and before we jump right in, you guys need to know a little bit of what's taking place. At this point here in John, in John chapter 20, Jesus had been born of a virgin, and he had grown up 33 and one half years, and he lived a perfect and a sinless life. I mean, absolutely no sin at all. 
tempted, but, but he never sinned. But he was wrongly accused, and therefore, basically, he was butchered on a Roman cross. And he breathed his last. He physically died. His heart stopped beating. And after that, he was taken off of the cross, and he was put, put into a tomb. And a stone was rolled over the entrance of that, of that grave. But three days later, he rose from that grave. You guys know this story. Showing that he was the victorious Savior. And then after he rose, he appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days. And um, the first time he appeared to his disciples, there was one man that was not with them. His name was Thomas. And that's where we find our place here in Scripture. Christ is going to appear eight days later, and he's going to find Thomas. So if you have your copy of God's Word, stand with me as we honor God's Word by reading John 20, verse 24. The Bible tells us this. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, now notice this, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Hey, that's helpful when Jesus appears to you after you thought he's dead. Hey, calm down. Peace be with you. Then verse 27, the Bible tells us this. Then he said to Thomas, this is the Savior speaking to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now notice Thomas's response. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Guys, that last verse is speaking to you and I. Believe and yet we have not seen. Uh, let's pray and then you can be seated. Lord, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to um, visit your word and to uh, meditate on this passage of scripture. And Lord, just pray that... Uh, those that have showed up here this morning would have come expecting that every time your word is preached, every time it is taught, Lord, you change us. And Lord, just pray that we would leave here today from this campus just looking more like you. That we would have a, a deeper understanding of who you are and, and what your mission is and Lord, that we would be able to fulfill that miss mission through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray this morning as we think about Christmas, that this would be a just a great reminder, not only of the stars of Christmas, but also the scars that you bear on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for, for what you've done through the cross, and we thank you for those that are sitting here that are products of the cross. and. We pray that this would be a time that not only encourages us, but draws us closer to you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, here in this passage that we've just read, we see a God with scars. Now let me ask you a question here this morning. Did you know there is only one man-made thing in heaven? Hey, well, be careful. What are you saying, Brother Travis? No. There's only one man-made thing that I can think of that is in heaven, as I began to research this past week. What is that one thing? That is the scars of Jesus Christ made by man. I just want that to settle in there for just a second. It's... It's those scars of Jesus as he visited earth from heaven that, that he received these scars in his hand and also in his feet. He received these souvenirs that he took back with him to heaven. He's kept these scars as a sign of his humanity. And when he comes again to 
receive his church to himself or, or we see him again we depart this is a sign to show us he is who he says he is in fact, I'd like you to write in the margin of your Bible, Zechariah 13, verse number 6. Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 6. I want to read this to you. The Bible says, And if one ask him, What are these wounds on your back? He will say, The wounds I received in the house of my friends. When we see Christ again, we will also see these scars. Man produced scars now we're going to see three things this morning about the scars of christmas and the first one i'd like to see is the scars tell us that as a man jesus suffered and we see this in john chapter number 20 uh, jesus invited thomas literally to assess to to see his scars to place his hand on those scars that he received now, in evangelism, or, or maybe you've encountered this when you're trying to witness to someone, uh, people ask hard questions in evangelism, right? Whenever you begin to tell them about Jesus, they begin to ask real hard questions. And sometimes they'll ask you this, why would a good God allow people to suffer? Have you ever heard that question? Man, you go knock on somebody's door and then I have that question asked to you. Sometimes it, it can be intimidating. But friend, I would submit to you this morning, that's not the hardest question that we'll come across. Why God allows bad things to happen to people. But instead, the question I find a lot harder to, to answer is, why does God suffer? You know, we think about, man, we're, we're fully deserving to suffer. But why would a good God suffer? He, he doesn't have to suffer. God suffered in human form. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse number 3, this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then a few chapters later in Isaiah 63, verse number 9, he says this, In their affliction, he was afflicted. Christ bears the scars in his human form. What about this? Does God still suffer? Does God still suffer? He suffered in human form as he walked this earth. But does God still suffer? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 verse 30 that he does still suffer. In fact, it, it says this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God grieves. God suffers. God has suffered and he continues to suffer. Well, how does he suffer? Where do we see this in Scripture? You know, whenever uh, God was speaking to Saul and Saul was persecuting the early Christians, what did he say? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see the grieving and the suffering of, of Christ? The body of Christ shows us that he also suffered. And then I asked the question, why would... Why would God, who is fully capable within anything in his character, why would he suffer if he didn't have to? Why, why would a perfect person who didn't have to suffer, why would he do that? And that leads us to our second point. The scars of Jesus show us that as a man, he sympathizes. What that means is he understands. God, as a man, sympathizes with us. He understands. And the, the reason why I'm going at this in this particular passage is because there's such a deeper meaning to Christmas than what we portray. There's so much deeper that we need to go with Christmas. Christ understands. Christ is there. Christ bears the scar so that we can experience Christmas. Christmas is because of us. Because of we needed God to come for us let me give you an illustration here that christ sympathizes with us whenever i'm visiting a family that's just lost a loved one or i'm at a bedside i make it a practice within my ministry never to say i understand i want to invite you guys whenever you're walking through the funeral home never tell a family i understand it's an insult to them because we we don't understand. 
The only person that truly understands is Christ. There's no way we can fully understand. When we go on a trip sometimes, uh, we pick up souvenirs, right? You ever been to Dollywood and you get one of them big Bubba Gulp drinks that you can fill up for 99 cents? You go to Florida, you get a keychain. Well, the reason we know that Christ is sympathetic, the reason why we know he understands, is because he's received souvenirs also. As he come to earth from heaven, he received the souvenirs here on earth. And that was the scars that man has inflicted. He's been there. He understands the pain. From we don't understand the pain, but Christ does. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, Therefore he had been made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful, faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiations for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus says, whenever you suffer, I suffer. And because I've suffered, I understand. For we have a sympathetic Lord that bears the scars on our behalf. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ knows, He cares, and He also understands. It's a man by the name of Dr. Paul Brand. And Dr. Paul Brand was not only a missionary, but he was a surgeon. And his particular people group that he ministered to was to lepers. Like lepers owl, not leopard rare. Okay? Everybody know what I'm talking about? So Dr. Brand would go and he would minister to these leper colonies. He said one of the saddest things that he experienced about leprosy was it removed the body's ability to feel pain. Leprosy does that to your body. In fact, in, he says this, If I had the power to eliminate pain, I would not exercise that right. Pain's value is too great. Instead, I would spend all my energies to help when the pain turns to suffering. Pain is helpful. And Christ experienced that pain. And sometimes we experience pain. Our Lord suffers and He sympathizes. Now, why is pain helpful? The reason why pain is helpful is, is a few reasons. It's about, there's a protecting purpose in pain. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 17, uh, man had sinned. And that, in that moment, in Genesis 3, verse 17, pain comes into the world. Why? Pain is actually a means of grace. If we never felt the effects of sin, that would be tragic. We would just continue doing whatever we want. And so pain has a protecting purpose. If you twist your ankle... Pain lets you know you need to take the weight off of it and favor the other one. Dr. Brand said whenever it come to the lepers, that what they would do is, they, whenever they experienced pain, they wouldn't not favor the other. You're saying, Brother Travis, where are you going with this? I want to summarize this very quickly. Because I feel like, one, getting off track. <laughs> just to be honest with you. Um, the reason why I speak of Christ's scars here at Christmas time is this. We serve a merciful Savior. So what does that do to us? We serve a Savior who loved us so much that He left a perfect place. I mean, He experienced pain for us. He experienced pain for you. Many people don't like pain. We live in a culture that hates pain. The American culture that we live in does not like to talk about pain. In fact, we try to hide pain. We, we medicate to try to hide pain. 
We, we do anything in the world to try to hide pain. But cross come to show us that pain is actually beneficial. Pain that was inflicted on cross is benefiting to us. It provided us salvation. Pain in our life can also be beneficial. When we experience pain, it's our body's way of showing us something's wrong. And, and, there, and there's different types of pain. There's emotional pain. Do people experience emotional pain? Yeah. There's basket cases everywhere. I wasn't meaning that funny, but it did. But not only that, there's physical pain we experience. There's spiritual pain that we experience. That's why so many people are on so many prescriptions today. That's why officers every day carry Narcan with them. Because people are trying to hide the pain. They're trying to dull it. They don't get along with their parents, so they turn to drugs. Or their family situation isn't working out right, so they, they dope up. They look for an upper to lift their spirits. The problem is they're taking sedatives instead of running to the Savior. Pain tells us that there is something wrong. Jesus came to, to bring us peace and joy because of the pain, so that we can endure pain. I want us to see one more thing. The scars of Jesus tell us, as a man, Jesus saves not only does he sympathize with us, he, he saves us because of, of his scars. Why was he nailed to the cross? Why did he let a man pierce his side? Hebrews 9.22 says this, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Christ had to have scars for us. But he didn't have to. The Bible goes on saying, John 10, verse 18, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Did you know Jesus was the only man who, who had to choose to die? None of us have the choice. The death rate, did you know this, is one to one. If you're born, you're going to die. Jesus was the only man that had to choose to die. Why? Why? Because he was perfectly sinless. But he did choose to die. The question is not why does man suffer, but why did God suffer? The Bible says in John 3, 16, you guys know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Isaiah 53, verse number 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. God loves us. Guys, whenever it comes to Christmas and this season, I just want to be honest with you. Like, my heart is so broken because nobody else is broken. What I mean by that is, like why, why are our lives not filled with the love of Christ? Whenever we come to this, this Christmas season, like we should be excited. When we show up to a service, we should be excited to sing songs. We should be building anticipation. We should be building expectation within our homes that Christmas is, is the most glorious time. Because for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people were looking for a Savior. They were just eagerly waiting. And then the angel speaks to Zechariah in the temple, 400 years of silence where they're thinking, has God forgot about us? And then Zechariah hears this angel in the temple that says, hey, there's, a, there's someone coming and you're going to have a son, and that's John the Baptist. He's preparing the way for the Messiah. And it begins to stir people's hearts up again. There's going to be revival take place in Israel. 
And then I step back and I look at today, and last week we talked about preparing Him room and preparing our hearts, and I just look around and I wonder, why, why, are, we not, why are we not excited about Christ? Is it because we've been filling our hearts and our expectations and our homes with other things besides Christ? Is it because we're looking to other things for satisfaction besides Christ? Has our thoughts and our time and our energy been focused on other things besides Christ this Christmas? Are we too worried about finding presents, making sure everybody's taken care of, that food's prepared? From we need to remember Christ this Christmas. We need to remember what He has done for us. We need to remember the scars of Christ. You know what scars are? They're tissues that have been torn and then healed back. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. If you are a follower of Christ, you're going to have scars. What do you mean by that? If you follow Christ, you will also receive scars Philippians 3.10 says this that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and then listen to this it says and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death for we as believers will not will not escape this life without scars like Christ you know the apostle Paul talks about this he said in Galatians 6.17 from now on let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Many people think that that verse is talking about the actual stripes that Paul received on his back. But that word in the original Greek is charismata. That means he's bearing the mark of a Christ follower spiritually. Paul literally had scars. He's also marked by Jesus. Is that mark in your life this Christmas? I also want to talk one more thing as we go to an invitation about the marks of a Savior. You may be here this morning and you say, well, I have scars, but they're not good scars. There's things in my life that mark my past where my flesh has literally been ripped open. But you can honestly say Christ is healing them back. Do you remember what Go back to John 20, verse 25. Thomas says, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. What was it that caused Thomas to believe? It was the scars. Friend, the scars in your life may be the greatest witness to our community. When people see your life, where you've been, or what the Lord has brought you from, and then they see how it's been healed back, that can be a witness to the outside world. When you can testify that Christ has healed you, that you're still recovering from it. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. The reason many times we receive scars is so that we can minister to other people. It says, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You may say, Brother Travis, I don't know where you're going with that. <laughs> and I submit it to you honestly. I have no idea either. And I also say to you, this would be a great time for us to just, just stop. <laughs> and to recognize that which is most important. Friend, what are you focusing on at this moment? 
Where has most of your time and energy been spent this past week? Has it been in, in what we have encouraged you with last week to prepare your home, uh, to pray, prepare your heart for Christ? Or has it been selfish ambitions where you have just tried to get through the week, never declared your dependence on God, you, you never spent time with Him this past week, or if you have, it's just been going through the motions? Friend, maybe you're here this morning and uh, you recognize that Christ experienced pain for you. And you're in a place of pain right now. And you really you really need help. I invite you to, to focus your attention on, on the scars of Christ where he was pierced for you. He's been there. He's sympathetic. And he's faithful. Dear Lord, as we go this moment of invitation, um, I pray that you would use a jumbled mess of a man. Uh, that Lord, whatever you desire at the end of this at the end of this service, Lord, would come about. We know that it is nothing that, that man has done, but it is solely you. Uh, it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.